Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Castro. Thanks to everybody who's taken time to be here today. I'm really honored to have been invited to present, and I really hope the information I have is useful for everybody here. So uh, I want to start by saying I am not an expert. I'm a specialist. You all have real experts on, the, uh, on this subject, and you have a wealth of them in Hawaii. You have uh, Dr. Robert Cowie, Dr. Ar Dr. Arnold Hara, Dr. Ken Hayes, all their collaborators, all their students. You have a wealth of expertise in Hawaii. My specialty is controlling snails and slugs with bait, doing it effectively, and doing it efficiently. So uh, snail control. Not really usually a very exciting subject, but in Hawaii, rat lungworms cast it in a totally different light, food safety, obviously. This gives it an urgency and an element of fear and uncertainty that I completely understand. Uh, we've, I live about 20 miles from Salinas, and the lettuce-growing regions of the California Central Coast have been through this before. Uh, people sometimes forget, but three people died in 2006 from contaminated spinach. Uh, changed our industry. The industry responded, showed that they managed the risks, and today growers still prosper, buyers still purchase produce, and consumers eat even more greens than they did 10 years ago. So I hope I can reassure you that the fear will die down, the pressure on the growers is going to ease up. It's not going to go away entirely, but it's going to ease up, and what's going to make this happen is the actions taken by growers, suppliers, and advisors. As a grower, job number one is taking action. Why? Because taking action is the opposite of being negligent, and negligence is what gets lawyers excited. Don't let the lawyers get excited. No good can come from that. Um, I know you're all already taking action to control snails and slugs. How do I know that? I know that because you're all buying slug bait. I say that as a joke, but I, you are. I, you're, I know you're all controlling snails and slugs that are key pests in a lot of your crops in Hawaii. And I know you're controlling these pests because you're succeeding to growers. So I can't stand here and tell you what actions are going to be the best for your operation. But what I can do and will do is to give you all an overview of the actions that you can choose among to build the best system for your farm. Um, you're also taking action by being here today. No matter how much you're already doing to manage snails and slugs on your farm, it's appropriate to refresh your understanding of these pests. We're going to do that today. It's appropriate to review all of your control options. We're also going to do that today. And going forward, it's going to be really important that you document all the actions you take. Everybody here knows the fundamental rule of compliance, right? If it ain't written down, it never happened. So when you get back to your desk, I suggest you print out the announcement for this event and put it in your food safety folder. If you take notes, put those in the folder too. Even better, make a new folder. Label it rat lungworm management. Put all this stuff in that folder and put it in your food safety file. So today what I'm going to talk about are how and why snails are pests, why you should care, as if rat lungworm wasn't enough, and what you can do about it. So let's begin. So snails and slugs are challenging agronomic pests. I don't have to tell anybody in Hawaii this, but all over California there are growers who don't know this because snails aren't a pest everywhere in California. They're generally introduced exotics. They're often invasive species. They're vectors of pathogens. They're livestock. And that's in there because that's one of the ways that they get moved around. People actually deliberately move snails around as a food animal. That's how they came to California. That may be how they came to Hawaii. I don't know. And then one more big thing is they're gross. They're disgusting. I put this picture up in California, and I get all kinds of reactions because in California, we don't know from, rat, from giant African snail. Hawaii, you guys know this pest really well, but this picture still has one lesson in it, and that lesson is wear your PPE. If you're going to pick this thing up, wear a glove. It's a host and vector of rat lungworm. Don't touch it with your bare hands if you have a choice. If you do touch it with your bare hands, wash your hands afterwards. So some of the most significant and intractable threats to sustainable agriculture. Uh, Dr. Barker is the leading academic agronomist working on snails and slugs as ag pests. He's a New Zealander. 
uh, no surprise. It's a perfect climate for snails and slugs down there. And he didn't write the book, but he did edit the book. And this is basically the theme of the book. Um, here are the crops and production systems that he looked at around the world. Uh, so you can see that snails and slugs have a really broad impact on ag. And a lot of these production systems are in place in Hawaii, I'm sure. Maybe more than I think. So there's kind of a subtle point with snails and slugs for most of us, and that is that just because they're introduced exotic species doesn't automatically mean they're a pest or an invasive species. Um, it often does. Snails and slugs that are found around human habitation, uh, human agriculture, other human activities, are almost always non-native to that location. And they're much, much, much more likely to become pests than any of the native species. California is kind of a, a laboratory for this. We have some great examples. I'm sure you have those examples in Hawaii also. Uh, we have about 280 species of snails and slugs in California. 39 of those species are introduced exotics, and basically all of the pests are the introduced exotics. Uh, so snails can exist in a place that they didn't, where they didn't, were not before, where they don't belong. They can exist for a long time without becoming a pest. But they have an interesting characteristic is they can then very suddenly and very dramatically break out, if you will, and become a pest where they weren't a pest before. And we've got a great example of that in California. I'm sure you've got examples of that in Hawaii. It sounds like you've got one of those breakouts going on right now. So the idea that something's an introduced species, it doesn't automatically make it a pest, but with the case of snails, it often does. And with that comes quarantine, comes regulation, comes all the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, so in California, uh, public enemy number one in the snail world is this handsome devil, brown garden snail. And this snail was introduced into California in 1848 near San Jose. It's now present on the West Coast, south to Mexico, and north to Canada in less than 200 years. That's plenty of time for this thing to crawl all that way, but it didn't crawl all that way. It got moved by people. That's almost always the way snails get moved around. People have been transporting snails since time immemorial. Uh, this is in California ag, around 10 million bucks a year. It's hard to put a hard number on it. Um, but it's a significant pest. It's particularly bad for leafy greens, strawberries, citrus, and nursery. Um, it's present in Hawaii. But you're very fortunate that it's only established right now on Maui and Hawaii. It's been intercepted entering both Kauai and Oahu in the past. And not surprisingly, came, in, came into Oahu on cut flowers from Texas for the Valentine's Day season one year. And it's been moved inner island on fencing materials from Hawaii. Things like fence, fencing materials, lumber, pallets, shipping containers, equipment, uh, those are all important vec vehicles for moving snails around into places that they, they don't belong. Uh, tile, interestingly enough, is a major vehicle for moving snails around the world. Tile is inspected very, very rigorously coming into the United States because of snails and slugs. Um, because of all this transport, Hawaii has, not surprisingly, had 98 documented snail and slug introductions, which has led to 45 known establishments. And Knowing how these pests go, there may be more established species than we know. Here's another good example. This is called white garden snail. That picture's taken in Oceanside, California, up by Camp Pendleton on the coast. Uh, this other picture is down by the Mexican border, also San Diego County. There's white snail there. There's some other species of snail that look fairly similar. Um, this snail was introduced into California in 1920, and San Diego is ground zero for this snail. It hasn't really spread all that far yet. In fact, LA County thinks they've eradicated it completely. We'll see if that's true or not. But it's, um, it's very adapted to the desert. And so one of the big worries is that this thing, if it spreads east inland from some, Southern California, is that it'll be in the desert gr growing regions very, very quickly. And it's very adapted to that. It's adapted to the desert because it's probably from Morocco or Tunisia. And I say probably because nobody really knows uh, where it's originally from because by the time the Roman Empire fell, this snail had been moved from the Atlas Mountains in Africa all the way around the Mediterranean to Gibraltar by people. People were moving snails 
you know, 1,500 years ago, uh, and probably for a long time before that. It's almost always the way it's people moving snails. This snail, the white garden snail, is considered to be probably the worst agronomic pest among all the snails. Um, pretty ambitious little critter. Uh, it's a pest of wheat. Everywhere that it co-occurs with wheat, it's a pest of wheat. This picture was taken in Australia, and this snail single-handedly caused a worldwide depression in the value of Australian wheat because fields like this would combine more bushels of snails than they, per acre than they would of wheat. Um, otherwise, rational, hard-nosed Australian wheat farmers actually abandoned their farms because of this pest. Uh, it's a worldwide pest of grapes. Everywhere it co-occurs with grapes, it's a pest. And San Diego County has rapidly expanding vineyard area right now, so it's likely to break out into the vineyards and become a, a grape pest in California during my lifetime. So kind of an interesting um, but not very uh, attractive case study right before our very eyes here in California. Uh, Amber says, I'm going to skip over this. They're an emerging pest in California, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip by them. They're primarily a nursery pest. Uh, Asian tramp snail. Uh, this one is in Hawaii. It's been present in the United States since the 19th century. It's a major pest of citrus in the southeast United States. Um, it's present in Hawaii where it's a pest of mango, coffee, and star fruit. Uh, it's a reported host of rat lungworm and a documented host of other uh, livestock parasites. Uh, it's widespread along the U.S. southeast coast, and apparently it's nationwide in botanical gardens, which shows, again, the connection between invasive snails, exotic snails, and plants being moved around. Um, it's probably spreading in the U.S. It was uh, the first confirmed find of this pest showed up in, in uh, the state of Tennessee recently, not surprisingly in a nursery. Um, it didn't just fly there. Uh, this pest is being intercepted on a regular basis in San Diego, uh, dozens of times a year, probably only a matter of time before it becomes established on the West Coast. And it, it is the master hitchhiker among the snails, hence its name, the tramp snail. Okay, golden apple snail, the one that you all know, I'm sure, in Hawaii. Um, this is a significant host and vector of rat lungworm, especially in China. Uh, it's associated with historic human infections of rat lungworm in, in Hawaii, and it's present in many parts of Hawaii, particularly it's a pest of wetland taro. It's in the taro in the Honolulu National Wildlife Refuge, uh, I have somebody tell me today that it's in, in Taro on Oahu. Um, you see in the right-hand photograph, this is an aquatic snail. That picture is taken in a, a tank in one of our research facilities. It's also a pest of paddy rice, and, which is what led us to get involved with it. We developed a bait for it, for the rice market. And to control an aquatic snail, a bait has to sink in the water, stay interesting, hold together, stay effective, stay attracted to the pest and not contaminate the water. We've done that. So for uh, taro in Hawaii, we have this aquatic bait labeled for direct application to the water available in Hawaii. If you look at the left-hand photograph, I include this picture because that's not two different snails. That's actually a male and a female uh, golden apple snail. The male is the one on top. And yes, he's doing what you think he's probably think he's doing. He's trying to make baby snails. Uh, I include this picture because what it shows is that this snail, even though it grows very large and lives fairly long, the males become reproductively mature while they're still really small. And that's one of the ways, that, that's one of the things that contributes to them being such an effective pest and spreading so effectively. Um, some pictures, if you haven't seen this thing in the wild, if you don't, if you don't know whether you have it or not, at certain times of the year it'll be very, very obvious because of these egg masses the photograph on the left, of course, is a uh, wetland taro in Hawaii with the eggs on the taro plant. The photograph on the right is a lake in a public park in Los Angeles. It was taken over by these snails, probably dumped from an aquarium. And the interesting thing here, again, that another reason why they such, make such effective pests is they lay these very large, highly visible eggs. They lay them in places that are really obvious and really accessible, and yet nothing seems to eat these eggs. We don't even think fire ants eat these eggs. So that's one more reason why they're doing so well as a pest. 
And briefly back to giant African snail. Um, again, in California, we don't know much about this snail. In Hawaii, you all know all about it. But I put this up here because in addition to everything else that's bad about this pest is in the Caribbean, it's emerging as a pest of tourism. And I know a lot of Hawaiians would probably rather that we tourists just stayed home, but we don't. We still come. But this pest is actually driving tourists away from certain locations in the Caribbean. You look at that photograph, um, a lot of the Caribbean islands have a climate very similar to Hawaii. They get a lot of rain regularly during throughout the year. This snail is big. That means there's a lot of meat in that shell. So when you dump those snails by the side of the, uh, the hotel or off the edge of the highway or wherever they're being dumped, that snail takes a long time to rot away. It stinks for a long time. It breeds flies and maggots for a long time. It attracts rats. It attracts ants. And because it rains regularly, those snail, those shells fill up with water. The shell is plenty big to breed mosquitoes when it's got water in it. And if it's still got a dead snail in it, when it fills up with water, you've got this disgusting soup of rotting snail and maggots and everything else that's in there. And the rat lungworm may be surviving in that water. This is kind of the equivalent of taking a bushel basket of dead mice and putting each one of them in a Dixie cup and putting it out to collect the rainwater. It's just, it's disgusting in ways we never imagined it would be disgusting. Okay, slugs and snails are vectors of plant pathogens. They're known to be vectors of certain Phytophthora species. They vector Alternaria brassica cola, uh, which is leaf spot of coal crops. They vector at least one sclerotinia. Fortunately, it's not the sclerotinia that causes lettuce drop. But one of the issues here is that if the pest can vector one member of a genus, it's reasonable to suspect it could vector other members of the genus. So this, these things could be spreading, for example, lettuce drop. Or in the case of California, Phytophthora remorum, the sudden oak death uh, uh, pathogen. Uh, they're also known to spread to carry at least one stem nematode. I believe it's an alfalfa nematode. And it's been shown that snails can feed on virus infested plants, and live viable virus can be isolated from the snail's feces afterwards. So they are potentially major vectors of plant pathogens, and they are known to be vectors of plant pathogens already. They're vectors and hosts of foodborne pathogens, which is, of course, why we're all here today. Independent of rat lungworm is a foodborne illness. Uh, a lot of it's associated with E. coli and Campylobacter. The uh, deaths in California from spinach were an equal E. coli. I'm not going to dwell on this because it's not the focus of our talk, but I am going to show you all a picture, picture being worth a thousand words. Um, this is an otherwise well-managed almond orchard in Kern County, California, in the San Joaquin Valley. A lot of these snails are dead. They were killed with my product. Not all of them are dead. And this grower did bring this problem under control eventually with a combination of baiting and mechanical methods. But there are two things here that we're going to talk about. One is this mossy cover on the orchard. It's very characteristic of mature, mature conventional almond orchards. We'll come back to that in a minute. The really important thing here is this and this and all of this and all of this. And it's exactly what it looks like, that snail manure, to put a polite face on it. This orchard had a layer of that all over the orchard because they had so many snails. So think about this. Almonds are harvested by dropping them off the tree onto the ground. Then we sweep them up into a pile and suck the pile up with a vacuum off the ground. You think some of that snail manure comes with the almonds? Absolutely. This is the kind of thing that gives food safety professionals nightmares. Almond orchards, when I, start, almond orchards, when I started in this business, couldn't care less about snails, no matter how many they had. Um, once the food safety departments found out that this was going on in almond orchards, suddenly almond growers bought, started buying snail bait. Because to let this sit and be like it is, is to be negligent in the eyes of a lawyer. So from a food safety point of view, you cannot allow a situation like this to persist. And that's what's motivated almond growers to start trading for snails. Snails don't cause economic damage to almond trees, but they cause econ economic, they have the potential to cause economic damage to almond growers. Snails and slugs are vectors of infectious human pathogens. 
Uh, schistosomiasis is a disease that doesn't occur in the U.S., but it affects about 230 million people worldwide. And this is a disease that actually is an economic drag on the world economy. This disease causes more economic damage to the world economy than any other parasitic disease except malaria. This disease actually affects the purchasing power of countries that buy American agricultural products. So it's, it's not just a bunch of sick people somewhere else. This disease potentially affects everybody who's in business, everybody who participates in the economy. Bring it a little closer to home. Fasciolosis is a disease that's primarily a disease of cattle. Uh, it's present in Hawaii. It's present in California. It's present in most of the continental U.S. Um, this disease does affect humans. We've had human cases in modern times in California. Human exposure to this disease is associated with foraging for, food, for plant, food plants next to water or in water. There's probably some of that going on in, in Hawaii, I would imagine. Uh, this thing is potentially a pest of any crop grown in water, any aquaculture crop, so taro, potentially even maybe fish, basically anything that's grown in water. These two diseases are both um, large nematode-type organisms. Liver rot is a big critter. It's like the size of your little finger. It makes a horrendous mess out of a cow's liver. You do not want this thing trying to eat your liver. And the 800-pound gorilla in the room, rat lungworm. So rat lungworm is present in the United States, of course. It's present in Hawaii, Florida. Um, that's Louisiana, not Los Angeles. But this thing would be right at home in Los Angeles if it got there. And it might, because this year we had two tourists come home from Hawaii to California with active cases of rat lungworm. That doesn't mean that rat lungworm is loose in the, Hawaii, in the environment in California, but eventually it might. So something we all, we're all all going to have to deal with it, it's probably going to be spreading. Rat lungworm is hosted by several common snails and slugs, and it causes a disease called eosinophilic meningitis, which basically happens because this parasite, which is microscopic, tries to get to your brain or your spine to, eat your, to basically eat your brain. But it can't cross the, blood, the uh, barrier on your brain, so it dies there. This disease is your body's reaction to all those dead parasites in your, trying to get into your brain. It's apparently a miserable way to die, and it could be a really miserable way to live, too, because it's not always fatal, but it can be very, very destructive. In Hawaii, it's present in at least 14 species of snails and slugs. Samples are showing positive detections up to 78% by species, depending on what snails you look at, what slugs you look at. And there are three species of slug that are the worst offenders in Hawaii. Uh, Parmerion martensi is a semi-slug. This is the focus of a lot of the concern now because it's really changed the risk landscape in Hawaii for rat lungworm. It was detected in Hawaii in 2004. And I found one reference to 1996, maybe before that. It's abundant on Hawaii Island. It, in Hawaii, it's a known pest of lettuce and papaya. And it seems to be displacing the Cuban slug as an agricultural pest in Hawaii, which is going to do nothing but raise the risk profile for food for foodborne infection, uh, the risk to farm workers. Uh, this is this is an issue because Cuban slug does not carry the parasite nearly as much as Parmerion does. And interestingly, it has an affinity for climbing man-made structures. And what this does is this elevates the risk to people away from food and farms. This also elevates the risk to children because they encounter the slug at a level where they see it and can, be, can interact with it. So very briefly, what do rats have to do? I'm gonna to touch on this only where rats uh, and slugs and snails interact. Uh, Dr. Jacobson will talk about the rat aspect of it in great detail. Um, rats are the definitive host, not, not snails and slugs. If you could, Eliminate rats in Hawaii, eventually there would be no rat lungworm in snails. Snails are kind of an accidental host, if you will. Rats on Hawaii, when they're sampled, uh, test 100% positive for the parasite DNA. So it's safe to, to, to act as if all rats in Hawaii had rat lungworm, even though some might not. And rats feed on snails. Um, when you find a little pile of empty snail shells in your greenhouse, that may mean you've got rats in your greenhouse. So if you control the snails, 
you're reducing one food source for the rats. Anything we can do to make it hard on a, on a pest like the rats is a step in the right direction. It's a small step, but it matters. Uh, it's worth pointing out that rats could be responsible for post-harvest uh, contamination in, in your food products or post-harvest contamin uh, infection. Uh, it's also important to realize if you're a grower is this may be somebody else's problem. If your farm is implicated in a, in a rat lungworm outbreak or infection, it is a real possibility that it was a post-harvest contamination and may have occurred after your crop left your farm. Just because your farm might be implicated does not automatically mean that you have rat lungworm in your crops. And it's an important point if it ever happens to you. And just to add insult to injury, uh, slugs will come into your rat bait stations and feed on your rodent bait blocks. In California, I have more and more PCOs coming to me and saying, oh, yeah, I buy slug one, put it in the rat bait boxes so that I can kill the slugs and they don't eat my bait. Because rat bait doesn't do anything to the slugs except make them fat and happy. Okay, I'm going to skip regulatory, except that there are quarantines and there are severe re repercussions for these quarantines. You guys know all about these quarantines in Hawaii, I'm sure. They can be used as a club against you. Um, nurseries. Nursery stock and cut flowers are two of the major vehicles and vectors for moving snails and slugs around. And it's particularly a problem in Hawaii. Uh, there was a nursery survey done in Hawaii a couple of years ago. 61 nurseries responded. Uh, 41 species of slug were identified among those nurseries. Up to 17 species per nursery. Eight species were new to Hawaii, discovered for the first time by this survey. That's a big deal. 27 new island records as a result of this survey, covering 17 species. Um, the nursery industry in Hawaii very clearly has a problem with this. I love the nursery industry. I'm the world's most incorrigible plant nerd. But the nursery industry has a huge amount of slug pressure, and this is going to be this is going to put you in the crosshairs. So it's important to have good snail and slug control in the nurseries. It's really hard. I work with the nurseries in California all the time. It's really a challenge. Okay, on to control. Snail IPM, know thy enemy. Sun Tzu had it right back in the 12th century. And there's stuff about snails and slugs that's worth knowing that may not be obvious and can drive your control efforts. Right off the bat with the biology, um, snails and slugs are, are cold-blooded, like a lot of other pests that we deal with, but they're pretty much active above 38 Fahrenheit. So the fact that they're cold-blooded is not going to be a limiting factor in Hawaii unless you're way up on one of the volcanoes. Um, what this means, though, is that cold, uh, snails and slugs are much more affected by moisture and available water than they are by temperature. And this can be used to enhance your control. This can be used to drive tactics for your control. In California, um, snails and slugs basically can't be active during the hottest parts of the summer because it's just too hot, too dry. They can't touch the hot ground. They can't see the sun. They can't experience the hot wind. In Hawaii, it's very different because you have so much rain and you might have 85, 90 degree days of bright, pounding sunlight, but it may have rained an hour ago. And if you're a slug, all you care about is your immediate environment. If that ground you're on got rained on an hour ago, you're probably still fine because the ground is still moist. And all you need as a slug is one leaf between you and the sunlight to protect you. So in Hawaii, you definitely have some challenges that we don't have in, in California because you can't predict the behavior in the same way as we can. So you'll, you'll need to learn how the changes in moisture affect things in Hawaii. For example, if you live on the leeward side and there's a sharp seasonal change, as you go from dry to wet, having bait on the ground when you have that, before that transition happens can be really important because that transition may drive activity in the snails. One of the activities that's going to drive is reproduction. Um, Reproduction is not surprisingly in snails driven by temperature and moisture. And it's been shown that snails in captivity will try to breed at the same time of year in captivity that they would have bred in the wild in their natural habitat. 
Some of them want to breed at the beginning of the wet rainy season. Some of them want to breed at the end of the rainy season. But either way, if you know that there's a change uh, in the season or a change in the moisture content from, say, an irrigation event or an unseasonable storm, having bait on the ground is a very powerful tactic because the snails are going to be active as a result of that change. And you're intervening in the reproductive cycle. If you can impede reproduction of the pest, you're steps ahead. Uh, you may have heard that snails are hermaphroditic. It's true, sort of. Um, for example, a golden apple snail, not hermaphroditic. But many snails are hermaphrodites, and there are some that can actually be self-fertile. So with those snails, it only takes one to establish a new population. That said, most important pest snails uh, are hermaphroditic, and they are not self-fertile. So good old-fashioned sexual mating is how most baby snails get made. The big difference is both snails can get pregnant. So they're very efficient at reproduction. And as kind of an aside, um, if you encounter br breeding mating snails, do not pick up a pair of mating snails. It's not just impolite. They actually do have an organ called a love dart, and they can stab you with it if you pick them up when they're doing it. Um, it may not hurt that much, but it's very likely to get infected. And with a, a pest that may contain a life-threatening parasite, you do not want that snail to have a chance to break the skin or get exposed to your blood. So don't mess with them. Hibernation and estivation. Obviously, hibernation is not going to be a huge factor in Hawaii because it's a response to cold. Um, the main difference that matters in this case for control is that hibernation is really hard to break. If you wake up a hibernating snail and offer it bait, it's probably not going to eat. Um, an estivating snail can be awake almost immediately. In June of 2015, in the depths of the California drought, we had 20 minutes of rain. During that 20 minutes of rain, in the hottest, driest corner of my yard, brown garden snails that were estivating boiled up out of the ground, got a drink of water, climbed up onto my succulents, started eating my succulents. And by the time I saw this, while the rain was still falling, so less than 20 minutes, they were already mating and they can try to make baby snails. So estivation can break very rapidly. If the snails are estivating on your farm, like during the dry season, or during a, a, a period of unusually dry weather. It's a very, very powerful tactic to have bait on the ground prior to an irrigation event or a rain event because that water will get the snails moving. And as soon as they've gotten some water in them, they're gonna look for food first and then probably an opportunity to mate second. So it's a very powerful tactic to be out in front with the bait when snails are gonna be coming out of estivation. Okay, biological control. In California, this is really easy. I just tell people, decolate snails. There are all kinds of organisms that feed on snails, but at least in California, decolates are the only one that's viable for, for biocontrol. For you guys, not an option. Um, the snail has been introduced in Hawaii occasionally. Apparently, it's not an effective biocontrol uh, um, organism. It's likely to be highly disruptive of native species, according to Dr. Hayes. And Dr. Hayes pointed out that uh, the rosy wolf snail, which is very similar to the decolate snail, it's a predatory snail that eats other snails, is already in Hawaii. It was introduced as a biocontrol agent, and it hasn't been very effective, and it's been somewhat disruptive. So you don't have the most powerful biocontrol option available to you. What else can you do? Poultry is one possibility. In California, uh, tree growers, citrus in particular, they use poultry. Um, it has some, some pitfalls. Poultry may be their own food safety issue. They may, running poultry through your fields may be considered a raw manure application. That has food safety implications. If you're certified organic, the organic regulations are very strict on when raw manure can be applied to organic fields. And by and large, those rules make it impossible to run poultry during the cropping cycles. So poultry, if you're going to do it, think long and hard before you do it. And if you're certified organic, talk to your certifier before you put poultry in your fields. Uh, if you do put poultry in your fields, apparently duck to the poultry of choice. 
The other one I learned about recently, I learned about it preparing for this talk, are um, planarians, which are a nematode-like organism. They've been introduced in the South Pacific, including in Hawaii, as a biocontrol organism for snails. And they have a real problem of their own, which is they're known rat lungworm hosts. They've been implicated in human infections in Okinawa. Um, and apparently they're not very good at biocontrol of snails. So if somebody you know says, oh, come get some snails from my place. I've got planarians. They'll take care of your problem. You might want to think hard about that before you do it. It's probably not the most effective thing you can be doing. Cultural control. We're not even yet getting into the chemicals yet, and we're getting stuff I really like here. Um, remember that orchard with all the moss? What's growing in your fields and how you manage it can make a big difference from a snail and slug perspective. Um, for example, cover crops and vineyards. I come from the vineyard business. When you mow the cover crop in your vineyard, one of the effects may be to drive the snails up into your crop, up into your vines, because that's where there's something green for them to eat. So you might want to, for example, set your mower higher and leave some stubble to keep the snails in, her, uh, in the cover crop. Or you might feel the need to till to, to mow every other row, leave some of that cover crop for the snails. Or rototill it or disc it to completely destroy it mechanically along with the snails and slugs that are in it. Um, that's going to require you observing what's going on on your particular site with your cover crop and your crop and see what's going to work for you. There's another practice that's used uh, particularly in Latin America where they grow a trap crop as part of the cover. They'll grow uh, alfalfa or vetch or a pea or bean crop, which attracts the snails. And then they can um, burn it or bait it or till it or take other action to destroy the, uh, the aggregated snails in the trap crop. Trap cropping is a long established uh, process, uh, uh, approach. You can also do the same kind of thing with uh, plywood traps in your fields. If you put plywood traps in your fields, what you need to do is every time you walk by the trap, flip it over, kill everything that's under it. And one of the reasons this works is that even though you're not going to get every snail every time, they do have a homing instinct. They will come to that trap. And so if you do this diligently, you will eventually get every snail that's ever found that trap. So that can work. Uh, mechanical methods. I'm a gearhead. I love mechanical methods. Hand picking, and believe me, I know what you're thinking. It really can work. It's not going to work if you've got 40 acres of coffee or 10 acres of strawberries, but if you've got a small market farm, it might work. If you've got a greenhouse, it can be very effective inside a greenhouse if the greenhouse is uh, tight enough to exclude most entrants. And if you've got a neighbor who's got a snail infestation or if you've got undeveloped areas on your farm where the snails are harboring, Hand picking of the pioneers can be a powerful technique to keep them out of your crops. Tillage and cultivation. Snails and slugs go down into the ground. They actually dig, some of them. I've never seen it with my own two eyes, but they dig to lay their eggs. They will dig to hibernate or estivate or get out of the wind. They'll also go down into, into uh, pre-existing cracks or openings in the soil to hide. And so if you can till the top, say, four inches or so of your soil, you can do a lot of damage to the eggs and to the, the uh, harboring populations. Now, tillage and cultivation obviously has its own trade-offs. If you have really steep, erosive conditions, you probably don't want to till or cultivate in a place like Hawaii because the erosion is probably going to be really high. But this can be a very powerful tactic for controlling snails and slugs. Crushing in place. I know this sounds dumb. When I was new on this job, one of the old-timers showed me a field that, that was in lettuce at the time. And he said that for years, that grower would prepare that field for lettuce planting by having his tractor operator go out there and spend two days driving up and down that field, pulling a ring roller to crush the snails and slugs in the soil. And it worked for him. He still had to put bait out, but it worked for him. And then if you're the kind of grower that we have a lot of in California, the kind that has one of everything in the implement shed, and you're looking for a good excuse to take them out and play with the toys, you can try this. This is a 10-ton Department of Public Works steamroller being used to crush snails along the county roads in north-central Montana, where it freezes and snows every winter. Uh, and these snails are interesting because they've survived for like 100 years in a place where it freezes and snows every winter. They were brought in by a group of agrarian uh, immigrants 100 years ago who brought their farming implements and their planting stock 
and at least one of their pests with them. And they're probably undergoing an outbreak, a breakout right now. They're becoming more and more of a pest. They're more and more coming more and more to the attention of agronomists and extension agents. Um, I don't know if the steamer was going to control them in the long run. Maybe we'll see. Exclusion, arguably one of the most important cultural methods you can take. Um, people have been doing it for years. Strawberry growers for years have been spreading snail bait around the perimeters of their fields. I know one nursery that has miles of six inch tall copper snail fence around their nursery. Um, things like ditches are probably not as effective. A trap crop as a, as a border may be very effective because if, if it actually traps the snails by being more attractive than your crop itself, that's working well and you can then get in there and control the snails in the trap crop. Um, probably my favorite exclusion story that I picked up is uh, from a nursery person in California and she said that where she works, they don't have a problem with snails and slugs in their facility, which is right in suburban San Francisco. What they have a problem with is snails and slugs coming in on other nursery stock, including nursery stock from their other growing grounds, from nurseries that they operate and own. And so what they do is they practice 100% uh, manual inspection of all incoming stock, and they handpick every slug and snail off that incoming stock, and it works for them. And I love this story because it says to me that even in the nursery business, they blame the nursery. So if you're a nursery person, you're going to get blamed whether you deserve it or not. Okay, chemical control, carbamates. Uh, this is a one-trick pony. It's a product called Measurol 75W. It's a federally restricted N-methyl carbamate, so you may have uh, cholinesterase blood monitoring requirements for your applicators. It has a danger label, so it requires a closed system, although I believe it comes in a water-soluble pack. Um, and most importantly is this is a nursery only tool because this material is not registered for any food or feed uses in the US. This is a high toxicity material with a lot of regulatory baggage. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be in your toolbox if you're in the nursery business. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, with the amount of pressure on nurseries in Hawaii, this may be a necessary tool in some cases. I'm told it's expensive, but it's probably cheaper than having a problematic snail or slug infestation. Chemical control of metaldehyde. Uh, metaldehyde is my competitor's product, so I'm no great fan of it, but it'll, it'll do its own damage to itself. Um, the biggest issue with metaldehyde is it was recently re-registered by the EPA. And EPA eliminated a lot of crops off the label, a lot of sites off the label, and uh, a lot of application methods off the label. So if you're using metaldehyde and you haven't read the label in a couple of years, you might want to read through that label next time you're in the, in the equipment in the uh, pesticide shed. It may not be the label you think it is. These are the crops that are left on the, on the metaldehyde labels for U.S. If you're growing anything other than these crops, you cannot use metaldehyde. And metaldehyde is not really compatible with IPM. Why? The main reason is that IPM calls for us to use the lowest toxicity material that's, that's going to work. Metaldehyde is toxic to everything with bones. It's famously toxic to dogs. It's toxic to birds. It's toxic to fish. It's toxic to people if we eat enough. Um, it's not a good IPM choice. The other thing IPM calls for is IPM calls for choosing um, selective pesticides with a high degree of toxicity for the target species, the target pest. Metaldehyde is obviously not that material. But iron salts are. Iron salts are toxic essentially only to snails. They control snails, slugs, and pill bugs. Um, they're not going to hurt honeybees. They're not going to hurt earthworms. Um, so these are the frontline IPM material of choice for snail and slug control. And they're the products that I represent. So I'm a big fan of them. Hooray for the good guys. Uh, iron phosphate is the original iron salt register for slug control. It's the active ingredient in sluggo and ferox. And if you're growing certified organic, this is the only one you can use, Sluggo. Uh, there's an organic version of Ferox AQ in the works, but it's going to be a couple of years yet. If you're a conventional grower, you can use iron chelate. Uh, iron chelate is a little bit more bioavailable. It's basically a conventional version of Sluggo. It is the same mode of action, the same very favorable toxicity profile, the same environmental profile. 
uh, and the same selectivity. It's only toxic to snails and slugs and pill bugs. Okay. Um, if you use, if you adopt iron salts as your snail bait program, it's compatible with your IPM program. It's going to be compatible with any sustainability standard that your customer wants to impose on you or that you've imposed on yourself. It deliver, it'll deliver superior efficacy, which is independent of temperature and moisture because metaldehyde relies on dehydration as part of the killing mechanism. Iron salts don't. Iron salts block the ability of the snail to metabolize oxygen. That independent of water. It's irreversible. And although it slows down as temperatures go down, uh, the FSC remains uh, very high at low temperature. We've got a broad inclusive label and it's MRL exempt. And what this means is you can treat every crop and site with iron snail baits. MRL exempt means you can treat crops that aren't on the label. If you're growing some sort of exotic uh, Asian vegetable or some sort of regional vegetable specialty and it's not on the label, if the pesticide is MRL exempt and iron snail baits are, you can treat that crop even though it's not on the label. These products have zero REI and zero PHI, except for Ferox AQ. That's a very new product, and the EPA has told us it's going to be four-hour REI for that one. Still pretty good, very small compliance footprint using these products. And because it has no non-target toxicity, it's the least toxic option, and it's the most pest-specific option. So with that, that's all I've got, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much.